The Soviet Union was the first nation to implement communism on a large scale and experienced unprecedented economic growth thanks to industrialization. But the communist dream didn't last long. 70 years after its inception, the Soviet Union collapsed and turned into 15 different countries, ushering in a new world order. But how did all this happen? What led the USSR, the country with the highest growth in the world, to collapse? Why did communism fail? Until the 1960s, the economic growth of the Soviet Union had been incredible. However, in the 1970s, this economic growth simply disappeared, while the growth of other capitalist economies like its archenemy, the United States, Japan, or the United Kingdom, continued at a rapid pace. By then, the Soviet Union's economy remained centralized, meaning that almost everything was planned from Moscow. Furthermore, the powerful Soviet economy had become highly inefficient. But why? Well, Moscow set strategic goals, and as long as these were achieved, they didn't mind squandering many resources on them. For example, the Soviet Union wanted to compete with the United States and impose its model of society. To do this, the USSR had to mark its territory and boast a nuclear arsenal capable of facing the American giant. So both powers began a costly arms race. The problem? Well, the United States could afford it, and the Soviet Union couldn't. Something similar happened with the space race. Although the Soviet Union achieved several successes, such as sending the first living being or the first human into space, the price to pay was too high. While the Soviet Union armed itself to the teeth and its economy stagnated, the standard of living of the average citizen remained considerably lower than in capitalist powers. In fact, the importance of the consumer goods industry in the Soviet Union will never come close to that of the United States. In addition to this waste of resources, the Soviet economy had two other major problems. The first was the enormous bureaucracy imposed by an elite of the Communist Party, whose aim was to maintain the privileges of this elite. Anything was valid as long as they continued to have the favor of the top leaders, and this led to a significant degree of corruption and constant falsification of official statistics, since failing to meet a goal could mean, in many cases, having to spend a long vacation in Siberia. The second problem was the lack of competition, which meant that state enterprises had no incentives to innovate or be efficient, because no matter what they did, another company wouldn't come to take their market share, and therefore companies didn't fear for their survival. In this context enters the character who will be the true protagonist of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. He was the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union from 1985 to 1991, and the Head of State of the Soviet Union from 1988 to 1991. Gorbachev stood out for being the most open Soviet leader of all time. Gorbachev was a communist, yes, but he believed in reducing bureaucracy and in an economy more open to the world. To get the Soviet Union to adopt this more open communism, he purged the institutions and put high-ranking officials with similar ideas to his at the head of the government. Among these was Boris Yeltsin, who would later become the president of Russia. So how did the Soviet Union improve its economy? Well, for starters, Gorbachev improved diplomatic relations with the United States, reducing spending in the famous arms race. The USSR also reduced the number of military troops it had in the satellite countries of Eastern Europe, and announced its withdrawal from Afghanistan, a costly war known as the Soviet Vietnam. It also began exporting its natural resources worldwide and engaging in trade, which was great for the Soviet economy. Additionally, Gorbachev pushed for a major economic reform known as perestroika. Perestroika is key because it transformed the Soviet economy from a state-controlled economy to a mixed economy, in which not everything was planned by Moscow and in which people were allowed to own part of these companies although they still had the majority of their ownership in state hands. Moreover, prices and production would no longer be controlled by the government. All of this seems like good news, right? Well, yes, but no. Opening up the economy was a magnificent idea to keep growing. The problem was how to make this transition, and it was too much for Gorbachev's government. Without government subsidies, many companies went bankrupt, and the economy began to falter. Many products were simply discontinued, and soon queues began to form in supermarkets. This caused the state to start having less income, simply because the economic slowdown meant less tax revenue for the government. This made the Soviet Union begin to accumulate a lot of debt, and it became increasingly difficult for other states to lend it money. The USSR was heading straight for bankruptcy, but could the new mix system be implemented before the Soviet Union went bankrupt? To accelerate the opening up of the Soviet Union, 
Gorbachev also promoted political reforms aimed at improving individual freedoms. These reforms, known as Glasnost, brought with them freedom of the press and informational transparency, which until then had been non-existent in the Soviet Union. In fact, Gorbachev dreamed of ending totalitarianism and achieving a true democratization of the USSR. The problem was that the economic crisis caused by the transition to the mixed economy model was compounded by improvements in individual freedom. So people were free to inform themselves about the country's situation and above all, to protest. The first to protest were not the Soviets, but all the countries of Eastern Europe that also had communist regimes and depended largely on the USSR. The first uprising to erupt was in Poland in 1988. Later, Hungary did the same, and finally it was the turn of East Germany. A popular revolution finally led to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and Germany finally held elections and was reunified. Something similar happened in Czechoslovakia, where the communist government also fell after a wave of protests known as the Velvet Revolution. In Bulgaria, the government initiated a series of liberal reforms before there were large demonstrations and the transition to capitalism was much smoother. Meanwhile, in Romania, dictator Nicolae Ceausescu was arrested and executed after a new uprising supported by part of the army that left nearly a thousand dead. In less than two years, the European landscape had completely changed and the Soviet Union was much more isolated than ever before. In 1990, the Soviet government thought that to avoid these protests that had affected all of Eastern Europe, the best thing was to hold free elections in which not only the Communist Party would run. But what do you think happened? Well, all the people who were unhappy with the Soviet Union's economic crisis voted for independent parties. Because let's remember the Soviet Union was not a homogeneous country, but a union of 15 republics. Where this was most successful was in Lithuania, where the independence party swept and proclaimed Lithuanian independence. But what did the Soviet government do? Well, nothing. It imposed an embargo on Lithuania, but it did not order the intervention of the Red Army. This led other Soviet republics to follow their example. Lithuania was followed by Georgia, and after it, the rest of the Soviet republics where there were protests and uprisings. So the Soviet government held a referendum in March 1991 with the following question. Do you consider the preservation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics as a renewed federation of equal sovereign republics in which the rights and freedoms of an individual of any nationality will be fully guaranteed necessary? Although the yes won with a very significant turnout, different republics added questions about their own self-government and independence. For example, Russia asked if Russians wanted Russia itself to have its own president. Seeing what was happening, the most pro-Soviet sectors conspired to carry out a coup d'etat that would restore unity to the USSR. The problem was that the coup met with opposition from the civilian population and from the president of the Russian Federation, Boris Yeltsin. After this dark episode, the pro-Soviets lost even more strength, and all the Soviet republics hurried to declare their independence between August and December 1991, with Kazakhstan being the last to do so. Gorbachev announced the fall of the USSR in a television speech on December 25, 1991. Communism had failed. In the history of humanity, many systems have triumphed and fallen just like communism. But the current capitalist system is probably not the exception. In fact, there is already an alternative proposal to the current economic system. I bet you've heard of it, Bitcoin. If you want to know exactly why it could be the future of our civilization, I recommend watching the video you have on the screen now. You will not only understand how Bitcoin works, but also why the money we use daily is worthless.